Good morning, Effort Community Church. Everybody awake? Yeah, all right. You guys, that was a, that was better than first service. But I'll tell you what, their singing in first service was incredible. Those guys sounded amazing. So we're just setting the bar already today. So anyway, welcome to ECC. We're just so glad that you're here. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, ministering to Jesus together this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, Psalm 103 says, praise the Lord, oh my soul. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to just bless the Lord together. Let's just sing this uh, chorus together this morning. And praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord and praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord, well, praise Him, praise the this morning. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Praise and praise the
Take my place, oh Lord, you bear. 
right now you could just lift your song to the Lord maybe there's a just something you want to tell the Lord that can only come from you let's just lift a lift a song up together to the Lord something from your heart you are wonderful Lord you are beautiful go ahead there's freedom here just lift it up tell him who he is just straight from your heart you are beautiful Sing it. And all the blood 
paid all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he was in white as snow and Jesus paid all and all to him I owe Jesus paid all, all to him I know. Sin had left a crimson stain. He watched it white as snow. He watched it white as snow. And he paid everything for me your sacrifice is complete and all that I need I find in you all that I need I find in you and oh praise the one paid my debt raise this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt raise this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt raise this life up from the dead and oh praise the one who paid my debt this life of from the dead and oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up we praise and oh praise the one
Amen. Can we just give a shout out to the Lord this morning? Just give him an offering, a clap, a shout of praise. Yes. And you guys sounded amazing. So how about we give ourselves a hand, all right? <laughs> yeah, you guys sounded great. That was awesome. We're going to dismiss our kids right now uh, to children's ministry. So children, you are free to go uh, to your children's ministry area. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and to rest on each child in this building. This morning, in Jesus' name, would you release a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God over everyone. In Jesus' name.
so you can focus and just listen to these words from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known to his ways, his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to the children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you who owe his angels. You mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Just bless him. Just say thank you to him. We honor you, Lord. God, I recognize that we can't even comprehend all that you've done for us. And maybe someday in eternity as we grow in the revelation of who you are, we understand the fullness of what you've done. And in this day and in this time now, I pray God, expand us so that we may know you more and more. And we might have all that you have for us, God. Thank you for loving us so well. In Jesus' name. You can feel free to take your seats. Thanks so much for participating in that. Thanks, Josh and the team, for leading us uh, in that, what we would call an acoustic worship set, which means that, man, it just, a lot needs to come from you. And so I want to thank you for participating in that. You know, I have a friend of mine that uh, is in church leadership across the state of Pennsylvania. So he goes from place to place to place. He happened to be here last weekend. And one of the things he mentioned, it was his first time here in our congregation, one of the things he appreciated and he mentioned that he said he loved the congregational singing. He just loved to hear your voices and loved to hear you sing. And I would say the same thing, and even as Josh mentioned that this morning. So uh, thank you for stepping into that as you have. I want to take a moment and welcome you all. It's good to see all of you. I want to look into the camera and welcome those that are watching online or listening later in the week, and especially there at Living Streams in Southampton, Pennsylvania, as you're tuning in. Uh, good to have you all with us. I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, if... Uh, this is maybe your first time with us or one of the first times with us. I would turn your attention to the Connect card uh, that's in the seat back pocket there in front of you. Uh, we would invite you to give us as much information as you would feel comfortable doing so. Uh, just hang on to this Connect card like all through our service today. Later on, uh, we'd ask you to meet up a little bit in a couple different places. Uh, there's two welcome centers at either entrance and you can stop by there, drop off this Connect card and we have a gift that we'd like to give you. Actually, another option would be just heading right over to this room and you'll see the doors open when the service comes to a close. It's called the First, or sorry, yeah, first Steps Room. And uh, a pastor will be there and we'd be glad just to meet you, greet you, answer any questions and just say hello and uh, thanks for being here. For those of you for whom Effort of Community Church is your home, I want to point out F the Connect card as well, uh, filling out this card or as well electronically. Let us know how we can be praying for you. I want to point out the offering envelopes as well. Thank you for your ongoing, faithful, consistent giving. 
And thank you for your generosity. Appreciate that. No matter how, whether you give through the envelope that goes in the kiosk or whether you give online, just make sure your giving is an act of worship and that it's intentional and it's generous. And uh, we appreciate that a great deal. Speaking of being generous, and those, of course, you know, if you're, this is your home church that goes in the kiosk that you'll see at the exits as you leave the auditorium later on. Speaking of generosity, I want to mention this to you. I mentioned this past weekend. Of course, Easter's coming up. That's the last weekend of this month. It'll be here before you know it. <clears throat> it's always a good sign of spring, turning clocks ahead next weekend, believe it or not. So um, spring is coming. And, uh, but one of the things that we've asked, we've invited you to do during the Easter season is consider a special offering. And the offering is not to effort a community church. I mean, we're just simply the venue by which it gets passed from us on to someone else. But we have, we're partnering with a, a nonprofit called RIP Medical Debt. And all across, you know, the three-county region of Lebanon, Berks, and Lancaster County, there's, of course, people that get in. I mean, we know how it goes. Medical costs are very expensive. And they get into a place where they have medical debt that they can't pay. And it's in this unique place of, you know, going to collection and then possibly going to bankruptcy. And then this, this uh, nonprofit steps into that place and actually begins to negotiate the debt to keep people out of bankruptcy. And so it's a certain, I won't go into all the criteria that happens all around that. All I'd simply say, in that negotiation, they are able to buy medical debt for pennies on the dollar. And so we're considering you, we're asking you to consider um, giving a special offering that would specifically be to RIP medical debt that would come to the church that would go to RIP medical debt that we're actually pay off a lot of people's debt. Like, I won't go into figures right now. I'm just simply saying that it is actually possible for us to wipe out the debt of Lancaster, Lebanon, and Brooks County that's in that position and even go far beyond that. So I won't go out and report back to you later on, uh, but we have the opportunity of doing that. So I just, I'm just offering that to you. I mean, feel no pressure. Just simply think about, okay, what would God have us to do in response in that way? And then I do want to say, so the how, E! News, you can use the offering envelope, just write RIP or cross it. You can just, however you give, uh, mail it to the church office, however you want to give that special offering is perfectly fine. Just make sure that RIP is indicated somewhere so we know exactly where to reserve that and pass it along. But the why, so two things. I shared this with you last week. One is that um, <clears throat> everybody in this room knows inflation is real, right? Your grocery bill, not what it once was, right? And not too long ago, I mean, just gas or whatever it is, like we know inflation is real. And so we're living in a time in which we feel like, man, it makes sense to actually kind of tighten up and maybe just like not be quite as generous. And according to Acts chapter 11, the church of Antioch, when that happened in that place, they actually operated in an opposite spirit. And they, they, acted, they acted with intentional generosity that broke that spirit of like want or poverty, however you want to say that. And we're asking you to operate in an actual opposite spirit of what we feel in our culture right around. That's one reason. The second reason is this. We want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ by being generous during this Easter season. And there's going to be, I don't know how many people, I don't know, but there's going to be a bunch of people across the three counter region and beyond that that will get a letter right around Easter. And the letter's going to be in response to a debt, a medical debt that they can't pay. They don't have the means to pay it. They're, they're, they're just, they're at their wit's end, perhaps. And it's going to simply say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your medical debt has been paid. And these are people, of course, <clears throat> yeah, these are people that, that are in a place where they can't pay a debt. And, and what's the thing, here's the thing about Easter is we are going to be pointing them to a different debt that they also have that they can't pay. It's not being paid by us, but it's being paid by their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're connecting a practical debt that they can't pay that's being paid to a spiritual debt that they can't, that they need, that they can't pay that has been paid on their behalf. And I think it's going to be an awesome time. Man, so, so carefully consider that. Also want to say welcome to Yvonne and uh, Caroline who are actually painting on our uh, platform. So they'll be here during the month of March as well. I want you to notice that the opposite side of your message notes is now a blank sheet of paper. So you can draw things on there. If you want to write notes, draw notes, however you want to see fit to capture some of the things God's doing in your own heart. And then, of course, we love to tell stories. And so Jim has got a testimony for you. I want to tell you about a couple of things that are in the testimony so you know what's happening. He mentions the word thrive, and when he talks about thrive, he's talking about the Thrive Discipleship Plan that Matt Swords leads. 
He also talks about giving the Lord your yes, and that's a major part of Thrive Discipleship, where Matt just simply says, hey, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, just keep your mind, just keep going back and giving the Lord your yes, and you that have been through that have, uh, have experienced that. And, but it's a great testimony of uh, Jim, who maybe just likes to kind of keep to himself, which I can relate to personally, and wouldn't be maybe the first one to step in. But at, in the message that we just simply say, hey, take one step, he took that one step, and the Lord did significant things in his life. So you'll enjoy the story, and then Chris is coming to bring the message today. My wife and I were talking to my son and his wife, and they come to Thrive the year before, and they really encouraged us to, to try it. So we signed up. I'll be honest, I've, I have trouble setting in a setting like that. But after a few times of coming, I, I'm really glad that, that we did come, because uh, I learned a lot through it. It was easy for me to say, God, I give you my heart, but I didn't always give him my yes. You know, and it come from my growing up experience. I couldn't always trust my earthly dad, and it was hard for me to trust God. But when it comes right down to it, it is a choice. I had to choose that to be able to say yes, you know. And I can say that now, but I, but I, you know, I couldn't before. Taking every thought captive, that was a big one for me because it's like there's a battle that goes on my mind, in my mind about different things. And before I would just believe a lot of the things, the thoughts that came into my mind. And I never really thought about it before, but when that truth came out, you know, I have to stop and say, where is that thought coming from? This ain't what God's saying about me, you know? So that really helped me, really helped me. One of the main things was the fellowship that I had, you know, with people around our table. And I've actually always I don't know how to word it, kind of a learner, if you know what I mean. Um, so for me to be in that setting around, around that many people, especially at a table, it was good for me. It was something that I needed. I actually got to go out to breakfast with a guy just last week from church here, and we had a good time, prayed for one another, and that was something else at one time I would I would have never done. I was to go out for breakfast with somebody from church. I, I'm just being honest with you. I, I've personally come a long way in life. I mean, I'm not where I want to be, but I think God ain't where I used to be. God has brought me through so much, and He's just awesome. I don't know how else to explain. He's awesome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. Jim's testimony about taking that next step with the Lord Jesus reminds me of a comment that Dr. Randy Clark made when I was in Brazil last year. He said, it's easy to give God your sins, but will you give God your will, your yes? And I was like, oh, that's so good. I can just leave now. That's, that's all I needed. Just that right there. Um, hey, I get, uh, my name is Chris. I get an opportunity to share with you this weekend, continuing our God Is series as we examine the attributes of God. You guys are excited about this series. Are you enjoying this series? Yeah? I can tell you that we, as your pastors and teaching staff here at ECC, we are thoroughly enjoying this teaching series because I'll let you in a little secret. Kevin just sort of told all of us, he said, hey, just build a biblical framework for and then share a bunch of experiences with an attribute of God, which, which essentially for a teacher means just tell stories. So we are in, thoroughly enjoying this teaching series. So we talked about, uh, we started off with God as provider, and then God is the one who sees us. And then we talked about God as father, as rock, as friend, and as healer. I think I got them all. I think I got them all. Um, do you guys have like one that's been really impacting you recently? Like you're just like still stewing on it? Okay, show of hands, when Kevin talked about like the pumpkins and God's provision, how many of you are like, I needed to hear that one? You can only raise your hand for like one or two. You can't raise your hand for all six, okay? Uh, what about when uh, Dan got into God is the one who sees us, and he shared his story about the loss of his mom, and you're like, that was, 
I needed that revelation. So good. What about Matt Swords? Remember when Matt was up here sharing and tears coming down his eyes and he's saying, is that what this is right now? And he's experiencing the love of his heavenly father in the midst of life. How many of you were like, that was, yeah, yeah. Matt's tears, man, they get me every time. Uh, what about God as rock? As Kevin opened up and talked about the challenges in the last couple of years and just like, I know who the Lord is and he is my firm foundation. How many of you guys were really ministered to out of that attribute of the Lord? Yeah. And uh, what about Wes? Kind of came up, shared, hey, we all suffer emotional hurts. He had been wounded in church, which very easily happens, but he found healing in church. How many of you would say that brought a lot of life to me? I'm still, I'm still even digesting that message. So many hands. Uh, and then what about last week with David as he talked about like, man, I just love the Lord. But as I began to work, I realized that it, I be, it shifted to a worker mentality and, and the Lord brought me back around to just sit me down and say, David, you are my friend. How many of you guys are like that one? That one hit me right between the eyes. A couple of hands going up around the room. So good. So I have the privilege this weekend of sharing with you another attribute, and that is God is all powerful. All powerful. 56 times throughout the scripture, that phrase is used all powerful or almighty to describe God. So this weekend, I have entitled my message, It Will Be Fine. It will be fine, which reminds me of a story. As a young, man, a young married man, I purchased a Jeep Wrangler, which is awesome for getting into trouble. And I used to love to take the doors off of my Jeep and drive around. Good weather, bad weather, it didn't matter. Love to take the doors off. But the thing is, I had this habit of when I would drive with the doors off, I would sit like this and I would hang one leg out the door. And the real problem with that is that it was a stick shift. So when I had to shift, I had to put my foot back in and kind of do the thing there. And, uh, and one day, Emily and I, my wife, were living in Lancaster City. And behind our house, we had two parking spaces where there was the parking spaces and then there was a curb and then it was up into the yard. And she was in the passenger seat and we pulled into our driveway and I had my foot hanging out the door and I pushed the brake in um, and I went right up over the curb into the yard because I had accidentally pushed the clutch in instead of the brake, okay? My wife, God love her, uh, said, you, you should not do that. You should keep both feet in the vehicle when you're driving. And I said, it will be fine. <laughs> it will be fine. A couple months later, I'm with my brother and about 20 of his friends, and we're in about five vehicles. We're driving somewhere. I think it was out in York County. And we stop at the gas station in Brownstown, the Sheets in, in Brownstown, uh, to fill up on gas before we continue our journey. And the Sheets gas station is packed, but I find a pump that is empty. I fill up the Jeep with gas. And then I look in front of me, and directly in front of me is an empty parking space in this packed packed parking lot right in front of the uh, right in front of the gas the store so I hop in my Jeep, start it up, my foot's hanging out the door, and I just sort of like, you do one of those things where you pop the clutch and you just kind of coast into the parking space, which is perfect. I nailed it. I literally nailed it because I went right up to those concrete posts that stick up out of the gas station. Ever wonder why they're there? Um, and I pushed the brake in, but because my foot was hanging out the door, I had actually pushed the clutch in. And my Jeep just slammed into the front of this gas station. Now, that would be enough, but it's not. Because what happened was I hit those concrete posts with such precision that the rubber like bumpers on the, on the ends of the steel bumper of my Jeep, they folded back around and then the, the solid metal part just ever so slightly bowed as it scraped through the inside of these concrete ballards and then it popped out on the other side. <laughs> Do you have the picture in your mind? So now my bumper is like trapped behind this thing and I can't get out. 
And my brother's friends are coming out of the gas station one by one, and they're like, what did you do? So we tried a couple things that weren't working. The manager from the gas station came out, and she's like... Do you need some, you need me to call someone? And I'm like, no, it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> and ultimately we had, since there were a bunch of guys, we just sort of picked the Jeep up and moved it, moved the front, and then we picked the back up, moved the back, and kind of worked at caddy corner until we could sort of squeeze that bumper out around the concrete post there. And uh, in the midst of doing this, a gentleman came up with a motorcycle helmet under one arm and a gas can in the other hand. And he's like, hey, I'm just wondering if someone could give me a hand with, oh, never mind. (laughs) It looks like you have your own issues. (laughs) So we finally got the Jeep out and we're just standing there staring at it. And it looks so sad. Like legitimately, it looks like it's frowning because it's perfectly crunched fenders on both sides. And it's just, it's just destroyed. But It will be fine. Like, you can get the Jeep fixed. It will be fine. Um, So when we talk about God as all-powerful, what I mean when I say it'll be fine is that God has complete power over all things at all times and in all ways. And that's in your notes. Complete power over all things at all times and in all ways. The first time I would have recognized that revelation or understanding in a significant way would have been my senior year of high school, October 2001, as I was away at a youth conference. And I think they're going to put a slide, uh, a picture up on the screen there behind me uh, at a youth conference called Catch the Fire. I know Matt Swords' conference was Acquire the Fire and Catch the Fire. Our youth ministry was Fresh Fire. We got On Fire, Cross Fire. Like there's so much fire. Like, in the young season, you know, when I retire, I'm going to start a connect group called Old Fire. I think so. That would be awesome. Um, Anyway, I'm at Catch the Fire, and I'm experiencing what can only be described as part of the power of God as I recognize that he is in complete control over all things at all times and in all ways. And there are about three and a half or four hour sessions that start with worship, do teaching, go back into worship. There's more teaching, maybe a testimony time and then some more worship. And as you saw in that picture, they would take all the chairs out and students would just spread out all over the floor on blankets, sitting in different, you know, in different groups and people would share. And I don't remember what session it was, but one of the sessions, I just began to feel overwhelmed by the power of God. So in worship, I just knelt down and then ultimately I laid down just worshiping the Lord Jesus. And then someone got got up and kept teaching, but I didn't move from that place. And ultimately, um, the session ended and the group went for lunch. Uh, And I just stayed right in that place of worship down on my face before the Lord, almost just convinced that if I dare move from that place, that I would just die. Just feeling the overwhelming sense of the power of the Lord in that place. And you know, if an 18-year-old boy skips lunch, who's otherwise healthy, God is doing something. And that's that's what was happening. God was doing something in my heart, something in showing me his power, specifically his power that is infinite. And we're going to look at a couple of scriptures uh, really quickly this morning, but uh, his infinite power. And by infinite, I mean boundless, limitless, without measure. The prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 32, O sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched, uh, outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. In Psalms 32, I'm sorry, Psalms 33, the author says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and the, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. God's power is infinite. In God are unopened treasures. There's an everlasting fountain of new creations, new beginnings, and new revelations. To suppose that in creation, God has expended all the inner possibilities of himself is just to completely miss 
the all-powerful nature and characteristic of the God we serve. That's why in Job chapter 26, Job lists this long list of things that God has created. And in chapter, or I'm sorry, in verse 14 of 26, he concludes by saying, and all of these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper that we hear of him. Who can then understand his power? God's power is infinite. God's power is also irresistible. It's absolutely overwhelming and all-inspiring. Later on in Job 42, he says, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. His power is irresistible. In Isaiah chapter 14, the prophet says, for the Lord Almighty has purposed. Who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out. Who can turn it back? God's power is absolutely irresistible. And not only is it infinite and irresistible, it's also inexhaustible. Isaiah 40, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In his understanding, no one can fathom. Psalms 102. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same and your years will never end. His power is inexhaustible. Hebrews chapter 1 says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. If Christ were to but for a moment remove his sustaining power, then everything that was made would suddenly become unmade. His power is absolutely inexhaustible, irresistible, and infinite. And that is why I say, it will be fine. It will be fine. So I get the Jeep out of the repair shop and stop driving with my foot out the door because I can learn things and sometimes I'm wrong. And my wife and I decide we should probably sell the Jeep. It's just too easy to get into trouble, which is true. So we decide to sell the Jeep and we're on our way driving to worship team practice. My wife used to serve on the worship team. Thursday night, they have practice here. So we, we still live in Lancaster City. We're driving up. It's a nice night. So we're going to take the, de- the, the Jeep, but the doors are on. Doors are on, foot's in. We're good to go. Earlier in the afternoon, I had decided to change the oil in my Jeep. Yes, at that time, I had learned how to change an oil in a vehicle. So here I have this half full bucket of used motor oil. And I know that in between our house in Lancaster and uh, worship team practice, there is a farm that has a tank where I can dump used motor oil. So I put the bucket of used motor oil in the passenger seat by the floor. And my wife comes out and we're getting ready to leave. She gets into the Jeep and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, look, it'll be fine. Just put it in between your legs, and I'll drive really carefully. (laughs) And she says, you should cover that. (laughs) And I say, it'll be fine. fine. (laughs) So we're driving up to Ephrata, and we're passing that stupid sheets in Brownstown. Like the same intersection when, when so, we're going right through the light when somebody t 
T-bones the side of my Jeep, right on the driver's side, um, and the Jeep goes up on two wheels, and then comes back down, goes up on the other two wheels, then comes back down, and then kind of skirts off to the side. And let me tell you something. A miracle happened because I did not have a single drop of oil on me at all. It's like that oil went straight up and came straight back down all over my wife. So we're over to the side of the road. And at some point, someone must have called the police um, because the police... Uh, show up, and he comes over. I think we were still in the vehicle, um, and he looks in, and you can see in his response he is assessing something, and it, you almost watch him immediately go into trauma mode, like I've got to uh, manage the trauma that's happening here, because he thinks that, that it's all blood. And I think at one point I reach out when I recognize that he thinks this is blood. I reach out, put my arm in front of my wife, and I say, don't worry, she's fine. (laughs) And she was fine. Um, It's me who wasn't fine. No. Don't worry. No worries. It'll be fine. Oh, man. My wife is fine, and uh, she might have just a little trauma to the statement, it'll be fine, but other than that, things are well. But here's a question for us to consider this morning. What about when it's not fine? Yeah? What do we do with God as all-powerful having all control over all things at all times and all ways when we're confronted with the reality that it's not fine. Like, what if that oil had been blood? What if my young wife had been seriously injured or even died? What if my marriage is falling apart? What if my friends are leaving me? What if my mind is failing me or my body, my physical body is betraying me? Like, what do we do with the hard, brutal, difficult things in life? I believe that God is all-powerful. But can he be all good at the same time? Can he be powerful over all things at all times in all ways and be good. And not the kind of Sunday morning I'm sitting in church, yay, amen, God is good, good, but the brutal gut-wrenching, not in my stomach, this is excruciatingly painful, I'm not fine kind of good. What do we do with those? Can I really stake my whole life on the goodness of God without trying to hedge my bet in life with other things. We all do it. Yeah, I trust that God is good, but I'm going to have my own stuff over to the side here. Can I stake my whole life on the fact that God is good? That is the question that I was wrestling with as I was laying on the floor in Toronto at Catch the Fire in 2001. And I'm wrestling with that question because a couple months before, at the end of my junior year of high school, one of my close friends who lived down the road, very close so we could walk to each other's house and hang out, uh, had convinced me to join him in his senior year at the Career and Technology Center. He was very interested in becoming a police officer So he decided he was going to go to Votech his senior year, and he wanted me to come with him. And you've probably heard me say this already, but the only thing I was really interested in high school uh, about was pursuing my wife, Emily. (laughs) 
Um, so I didn't really think about what comes after school or anything like that. So the idea of hanging out and goofing off with my buddy at Votech in this class seemed really great, um, really a great idea. So two or three weeks before school started, I was over at Travis's house, and I think we were playing video games. I think it was a Saturday. Um, left his house, came home, got word the following day that Travis had passed away. Not a car accident that could be explained or just the brokenness or the foolishness or the things that happen in life, but something so random as a brain aneurysm. An otherwise healthy 18-year-old boy full of life and plans and future, just one moment alive, hanging out with his friends, and the next moment just gone. It's Saturday, all the things you would expect of an 18-year-old boy and his family, and Sunday, mom and dad are planning a funeral. So I'm carrying this into the beginning of my senior year. So here it is, the beginning of September, Travis has passed away. I'm, I'm confronted with the reality of God's goodness. Can you really be good and be in control over all things at all times and in all ways? And I remember sitting in that classroom, that law enforcement classroom at Votech, wrestling with that reality of, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know anyone. What am I doing? And then on the TV, I watched the second plane fly into the tower for the September 11th terrorist attacks. And all of a sudden, my personal tragedy is now overlaid with a national tragedy. And more questions. God, how can you be in control of everything at all times, in all ways, and be good. I do not understand what is happening here. It's this reality that I'm being confronted with as I lay on the floor in Toronto. God, are you who you say you are? And the truth is, God confronted me with something back. And what I was confronted with was the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And in that moment, laying on the floor, I'm confronted with the power of the gospel of Jesus. Now, I had grown up in church. I was a Christian. I had been baptized at a young age. But there are points in your life when you have to decide what you believe and why you believe it. And this was one of those points. I'm confronted with Jesus, God, on a cross. And here's the question. Is that really God on a cross? An instrument of execution and torture. Is that God on a cross? The Bible says that's the power of God unto salvation is the gospel, Jesus on a cross. Can we just pause for a second? And can we think about what it means that God would be on a cross? God, whose power is infinite, without measure, without limit. God, whose power is irresistible. No agenda of man. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. God, whose power is inexhaustible, if he were but to remove his sustaining word, it would all become unmade. God, on a cross. What could that possibly mean? At the very least, what it means is that God was not distant from the problem of human suffering. Rather, he became part of it. Scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He gave of himself. Every ounce of human suffering passed through Jesus on that cross in that moment. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. In that moment, as Jesus is on the cross, he settles once and for all throughout all of history. He displays the goodness of God in that one moment. But what happened next displayed the power of God. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 50. Do you know why Kevin says to bring your paper Bibles? So when you wait for people to find the passage, you can hear when most, most of the people get there. <laughs> Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. You see, once I settled the question of is God good, even in my own life, in my own experiences, my own circumstances, once I settled the question of is God good, I could actually begin to see the power of God come into focus. And I love this passage in Matthew 27. I love this picture. The curtain is torn in two. It's torn from the top to the bottom. It is a divinely determined act of his will. He's the one who did it. We didn't have anything to do with it. That temple is torn and we can be in relationship with him. The earth quaked, rocks split, and the tombs of many people opened up. The world was in great distress as Jesus surrendered his physical body on that cross. Many holy people who had previously died got up out of their graves and walked around. Did you ever wonder why 3,000 people got saved when Peter preached? It's because there was a bunch of dead people who were back in their families. Do you ever wonder how this whole nation, uh, with their understanding about God for thousands of years, all of a sudden, after the resurrection of Jesus, this whole thing balloons and just explodes in this recognition that, yeah, God became flesh. God, God, in his infinite, inexhaustible, irresistible power became flesh and lived among us. Man, the dead people... They got out of the tombs and they walked around to the point where even the centurions and those in charge of the execution of Jesus stood there and said, surely this was the son of God. Man, church, I am so jealous for me personally and for us corporately to be a people that know the veil is torn from the top to the bottom. It has nothing to do with our own effort. God is the one that made the way. And I can live now moment by moment in relationship with a loving father, with God himself. Man, I am jealous, church, to live in an age where things are disturbed. I don't want things to be easy. They shouldn't be easy. There's tons of people who have not heard the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. The world is disturbed. And in the midst of that disturbed, distressed world, I am jealous for a church that recognizes I once was dead. But now I am alive. And as I walk around, by the nature of who I am, I give testimony to the power of Jesus, 
to the resurrection power of Jesus in my life. And man, to live with that testimony in such a way where the world looks at us. Even the world that says, I will never give glory to God. I will never bow the knee to Jesus. I will never make Jesus my Lord. Even they will say, surely that man was the son of God because look at the testimony of his people. Man, I'm jealous to live in those times. His infinitely great power is actually at work in us. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 1 that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. It is active in us. So when I say God is all-powerful and it will be fine, what I'm saying is God is good, historically good, observably good, evidenced in every possible way good. For God so loved the world that he gave good, truly, holy, and conclusively good. But he's also powerful, power with a power that's preeminent, unmatched in its, in its measure, unlimited in its means, power to lay his life down and then power to pick his life back up, power to create and destroy, almighty wonder-working power. But that's a bit of a mouthful. So I just say it will be fine. It'll be fine. Let me tell you, tell you a secret. When I was on the floor in Toronto experiencing the power of God, that wasn't even the greatest revelation of his power I've had. And there have been so many since then. And almost all of them, in fact, I believe all of them, were quite mundane and ordinary. And you recognize this as part of re regular everyday life. That in the midst of our failures and faults and uncertainties and fears and sins, it's the power of God that actually comes in in those moments and transforms us, is it not? I want to ask you a question. Is God's power frustrated? Is God's power frustrated? Is it frustrated with the things that are happening in the world? Is God's power, is his power frustrated by the things that are happening in my personal life? You see, I used to think that, man, God, it must frustrate your power to try to work in my life. I feel so ineffective. I, I feel so weak. Yet scripture says that God's power is made perfect in weakness. In fact, Paul goes on and continues in that same passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 to say that God's power, or I'm sorry, to say that he will boast all the more gladly about his weakness. He's boasting gladly about his weaknesses because he knows that God's power is made perfect in weakness. You know, it can be easy to look at other people's lives and just assume things. I want to tell you something. I don't expect you to believe me, but I promise I'm not lying to you. I'm not a confident person. I'm not confident on this stage. I'm not confident in some of the things the Lord has asked me to do. I'm not oozing with confidence. What I am is experienced with my own weakness. And for whatever reason, God chooses to demonstrate his power time and time again in my weaknesses. And Paul says, that's why I gladly boast about my weaknesses. That's why I say, it'll be fine. This is in your notes. When you settle his goodness, you can acknowledge his power. When you acknowledge his power, you can embrace your weakness. And when you embrace your weakness, you can display his power. I have lived on and stewed over that thought process for 20 plus years.
He is good. I'm weak, but in my weakness, he can display his power. I want to invite you to stand. I want to read a scripture over you as our time comes to a close this morning. If you have your Bible and you want to follow along, it's in 1 Corinthians. Or feel free to just close your eyes and let me just read this passage over you and over us. Starting in verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think not of what you were when you were called. For not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So that because of him, I'm sorry, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimonies about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. And my message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I want to invite you as you're standing, if, if you feel comfortable, put your hands out. And I want you to imagine, either imagine it right in your hands or just recall it to your mind. I want you to imagine some of the weaknesses that you're dealing with in life right now. Maybe it's a relationship, spouse, parent, child, co-worker, and you're just saying, God, I do not have what I need. I feel weak to be able to, to respond how I should in the midst of this situation. Maybe it's external to you and it, it connects to a job and provision or schooling and something you need from the Lord and you just feel like, I don't have what I need. I feel so weak, so ineffective to the task that God has called me to. Maybe it's internal to you and it's a personal thing where you're saying, God, I've been wrestling over this thing or these things and I feel like I'm making no headway. I simply have no strength to be the kind of man, the woman that you've called me to be, to resist temptation, to do what you've asked me to do, to walk the way you've asked me to walk. God, I feel so weak. And I just want to say that some of you right now, as you consider those weaknesses that you feel in your life, you're in distress right now. But I want to come to you as best I can with a confession about the character of God. And it's this. He has complete power over all things at all times and in all ways. He is good and his power is made perfect in weakness. I have two things I want to pray, two confessions I want to pray. The first one I'm going to invite you to repeat after me. It's a personal confession. And the second one is a corporate confession for us as the body of Jesus in this place at this moment. Um, so let me lead you in those. First, the personal confession. Father, I trust in your goodness as displayed by Jesus who willingly went to the cross. I believe according to the punishment that brought me peace when Jesus died my sins could be forgiven when your mighty power raised Jesus to life I too could receive new life I say yes to that good news which is the power of God unto salvation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Father, I thank you for this body of believers, this church. God, we would just echo your words. We are here as a demonstration of your spirit's power, and that is it. 
our faith does not rest on the wisdom of man or the power of man, but on the power of God. God, forgive us for trying to hide our weakness or pretending that we don't have any instead of boasting them in such a way that allows us to give testimony to the God who is all-powerful. Amen.
visiting with friends and family is, is a significant part of our weekend gathering. I want you to know that right across in the gathering space, coffee is brewing and ready for you. Up in the cafe, coffee, because fellowship and just sitting around the table and talking is a great part of uh, our gathering every single weekend as well. So even as we go, then just want to remind you about a couple things. Uh, connect card, the uh, offering envelopes, and the kiosk as you leave. Uh, for those of you that might be new among us, First Steps room is right over here to my left, and folks will be there. I'm happy to visit with you. Next Steps, if you want to take some Next Steps, just like Jim did, it's right through those doors, right around the corner there as well. And uh, I want to leave you with this. When Jesus himself was transitioning, you know, perhaps very transitioning, meaning that Matthew 28, Acts chapter 1, where he's actually ascending into heaven and turning over to the ministry to us. He simply says, go and make disciples of all nations. In Acts chapter 1, he just simply said, hey, wherever you go, Jerusalem, Judea, remotest parts of the earth, go. Now, I think that we overcomplicate that a great deal. And we think that it belongs to somebody else, and we think that it's, I think it's actually a lot more down to earth in many ways than what we oftentimes think it is. So, as you go, this, go today, keep those, you know, Matthew 28, um, Acts chapter 1, be ready to make a difference right from the place where you are. And so that can mean some very simple things like um, drive courteously, courteously, especially if you've got Jesus sticker on the back of your vehicle. All right, for real, please. Um, be nice to people. Uh, put a smile on your face. Be courteous to people when you walk into the sheets, especially, you know, it's dramatic there. Uh, don't tell me you know Chris. Let's so keep Chris's name. I'm just kidding. Pay your bills on time. Show up for work on time. Be a good employee. Be a good student. Like all these things that are just very, very practical that all reflect the life that Jesus Christ would have for us to the world around us. So go and be a witness. Go and make disciples. Come on, man. Let's just go, let's just go live it out in just very, very practical, practical ways. So go and be blessed, but also as you are blessed, be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Look forward to seeing you next weekend.